is talking about burst buffers, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, but burst buffers are something that are on the machine room floor of some of the facilities now, and they're not really in general availability, but they will be soon, so I want to kind of give you a heads up of what, what to expect. And I'm uh, going to be focusing on uh, NERSC uh, facility. They're going to be one of the first ones to have a proper uh, burst buffer implementation generally available, so we'll, we'll talk about them first. So what's a burst? Um, so we're talking about big applications. Uh, traditional application will have a phase of compute, um, you know, a phase of coordination, a phase of dumping a checkpoint or doing output. And so what happens when you have these big cycles of time in your application is that when it comes time to do I.O., there's going to be just a torrent of data coming out of your application, and then there's nothing for a while, right? So it's an extremely bursty pattern. There, there are some applications that will trickle out data as they go, but that's uh, pretty rare on a big HPC system. So to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is, uh, this is old data, but it's, it's the data I have, so we're going to talk about it. But uh, we, what we did is we looked through um, a month of activity uh, several years back on our previous system and just mined through some logs and tried to find some applications that exhibited this behavior. So we wanted to get an idea of what it was really like. We kind of all know this is happening, but we don't know the parameters. And we isolated uh, four particular applications that were running um, from a few different fields and looked at how big they were and how big the bursts were. And these examples are all the way from uh, 128K processes, which was the biggest you could run on this particular system, uh, down to 4,000 processes. And the runtime we're talking about is hours. Um, you know, the, actually, this particular machine would only let you run for 24 hours at a time, so these are these are getting pushing into kind of the maximum runtime they were allowed per job. But what we saw is that these applications might, in one burst, uh, output you know tens of terabytes of data. Uh, several other ones would output hundreds of gigabytes, um, maybe approaching a terabyte again. And it may happen once, maybe just once at the end of the job. You all right? I've calculated all this stuff. Let's push it out. Or there's some that are going to have checkpoints or time series that they're putting out from time to time. But at any rate, there's going to be this burst of activity, then a gap of time, um, maybe a minute, maybe several minutes, um, maybe not until the end of the job. And then there's going to be another big burst of the same type that you saw before. So this is a little bit of a challenge. You know, How do you build a storage system that can take these you know, monumental bursts and then just kind of sit there and not have anything to do for a while? And there's probably a way you can architect the system to deal with this a little better. So we go back to our, our stack that we've been showing, and uh, you know what we uh, what we typically think of is there's your compute nodes, there's your network, there's your I/O hardware. Um, what we've done is we put more I/O hardware in there, so there's going to be two layers, two tiers of storage. Uh, the top one is optimized for bursts of traffic, so this is meant to absorb this kind of torrent of you know short time frame activity um, and you can build this specifically to do this. You put this close to your compute node so you don't have to go over many network links to get there and you put SSDs in there, you put NVRAM in there, you put you know hardware that's better at dealing with fast traffic. Um, the problem is doing what I just described is expensive. So you can't just build a storage system where all the storage is close, all the storage is SSD, it's all cutting edge. Uh, we won't be able to afford it, and it may not last long enough to hold your data for years. So that's when we go to the second level, which is more like what we have today, what we've been talking about in our previous slides, which is the conventional big, you know, spinning disk, uh, enterprise storage, backups, all this stuff. So you're trying to get the best of both worlds, something that can take these big chunks of data and then something that can hang on to it for a long time, you know, once your simulation's over. So where do we put this? If we look back at our previous diagrams, uh, an obvious place to put this is at your I.O. forwarders, which is the transform layer that Rob talked about that takes data from the compute nodes and gets it out to your storage system. Uh, what we can do is just put a drive there. Um, so on the way through, rather than going all the way to the big storage arrays, we can write it right there and return to the application and say, yep, we've got it. So this is, uh, this is coming soon. Um, and the two that are uh, kind of are perhaps most relevant to this audience, uh, Argon is deploying uh, uh, a burst buffer architecture based on IBM products. So what they've done is there's um, there's actually two big uh, IBM file systems at Argon right now, Mira 
and what they're doing is putting a third one on top of it that's faster. So data will go to this faster file system and then get asynchronously pushed out to the slower file systems. Uh, the nice thing about that is that it's very transparent. Um, you actually won't do anything different. You'll just uh, access your files like you normally would and they'll be faster. Um, this is also a little harder to architect. That's a challenging computer science problem to get that to work right. So it's going to be just a little bit before that comes online, but the hardware is there. They're working with IBM to sort out you know, the ins and outs of it. A uh, second model that you'll see at NERSC, um, particularly on their Cori system, is they have what's called Cray Data Warp. And this is a little different in that it's not supposed to, well, it can be transparent, but it also has a mode where you start your job up and you say, here's how much burst I want, here's where it's going to be, and then you use that burst buffer when your job's over, it goes away. Um, so it's a little more explicit. You're, you're really thinking about this as a separate storage resource that you're using. But all in all, the, the ideas are the same. Um, you want to have put the storage closer to your compute nodes. You want to be a little more amenable to latency bound operations. Going to use uh, hardware that you see on you know, all, your, all your laptops probably have solid state devices. So why don't, why don't your HPC systems have it? And they're not going to be real big because um, they're fast, they're expensive, they're going to be smaller. So I'm going to talk about the uh, nurse use case in particular. Um, because it's, uh, it's available right now. Some projects already have access to it. Some of you may have access to it, I'm not sure. Um, and you know, we'll learn some things that'll probably be applicable to other systems in the future. Um, NERSC in particular has a, a big kind of kind of wild user base compared to the other DOE facilities. Uh, there's, over, there's thousands of users, hundreds of projects, hundreds of different applications. They're very diverse. And what NERSC did is they put out a call for who would like access to this burst buffer system. And as you might expect, uh, going to make my IO faster? Yeah, great, let's try it. So uh, they got a lot of uh, interest in it, and they had a competitive process to pick some projects. Um, and they're trying to work directly with those applications to get some kind of examples of applications that are really using the burst buffer well. Then when they open it up to the community at large, they'll kind of have some examples to go on and, and some experience to, to apply to that. And this is, uh, right now, this is sort of like I'm describing this as sort of a pilot program thing, but um, you know, you come back in five years and you won't be able to find an HPC system that doesn't have something like this. Uh, all the new systems are going to have some flavor of this. Um, you know, of course, at Argon we have a Theta system coming, which uh, is actually opening up for open science next week, maybe. I'm not exactly sure how the storage is going to be used there, but it does have some of the hardware resources in a small scale that you would expect of a burst buffer. Our big system coming in 2018 or maybe 2019 called Aurora actually has uh, two layers of burst buffer. There's NVRAM that's going to be on the compute nodes, and then there's SSDs that are going to be on some other nodes. Um, and all the other big uh, coming kind of 2018 and later time frame systems are going to have NVRAM scattered about. So it's going to be here. You know, so what does this mean for applications? Uh, from the actual source code in your application, it's not too different. It's just a faster file system that you have access to, um, hopefully with better performance. What the real difference is most likely going to be for a lot of these deployments is that when you submit your job, you're going to have some extra parameters to control this resource. And I'll, I'll give an example of that towards the end of the slides. But you know, what you may be doing when you submit your job, when you're ready to run your simulation, is you say, here's how much capacity I need, um, here's the data that I'm going to be accessing, and here's where I want the data to go when I'm done. So what's going to happen is it'll copy data from your slow storage system, have it there ready for you, it's hot, it's ready to go, your application runs on it. You output some data, and once your job finishes, it gets copied out to the storage system for you. So it's like a scratch pad, and you get some control over what comes into the scratch pad and what goes out of the scratch pad. And uh, you know, there's some, of course, there's going to be some recommended things to do and don't do with this uh, model. Uh, we're still working on that. We know a few things already, but um, this will probably evolve over the, the next year or so. So to give you an idea of what the hardware looks like on a real system, I'm going to uh, talk about the Cori system and. Thanks to the uh, nurse folks for giving me a lot of material here. Um, I'm, I'm an Argon person, so this is this is coming from a different facility. But what their system looks like is uh, you know, there's a, um, an I/O node, which is the same I/O forwarding node that we've talked about before. 
But what they've done is they've put a lot of other nodes next to it that have solid state drives in it. Um, and we'll talk about what that actually looks like at a node level. So when you go to access your storage system, you can go through the I.O. nodes to the parallel file system, or you can go straight to these burst buffer nodes that have solid state drives on them. Um, that'll be faster. And here's what the hardware looks like. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, these compact nodes, just like the compute nodes in the system, but these nodes that do the burst buffer have been optimized for I.O. So in particular, they have uh, PCI connectivity to connect them to their drive controllers and their SSDs. So they have some high-end Intel um, three terabyte SSDs. There's four of them per box, and there's two uh, processors per box. And this is wired. The interesting thing here is that this this is, you know, the left side of this figure is kind of somewhat normal compute node or, or you know data center node. The right side of the figure is where it gets interesting for HPC because it is wired straight into the fast network that your compute nodes are using. So there's a custom HPC network there, uh, Ares or, or Gemini in the Crace sense, and that's giving you the fastest route possible to your application. And when you look at it in the system, you know, our, our uh, earlier thing, you, you imagine disk drives as this thing that's off somewhere. You know, it's over in these racks, you know, maybe it's a few meters away. Um, that's not the way the burst buffers are physically. They're, they're right there in the same cabinet, um, you know, a few inches away from your compute nodes. So, I mean, you know, speed of light and hops and all that stuff, it's just right there. You can get to the storage. So how do you use it? Um, hardware looks neat. It exists because I showed a picture of it, so you know it's real. But uh, how do you use it? Uh, the thing that happens, as I mentioned earlier, when you uh, go to submit your job, you can reserve some of the capacity. So there's 1.5 petabytes. Uh, you won't be able to say, well, I'd like 1.5 petabytes. Uh, that probably won't get through the scheduler, but if you put in how many terabytes you need, it will allocate you know, a certain subset of the burst buffers for you to use. And you start your job, and it looks at the directives in your job script that says, here's the data that I'd like to use, and it allocates some room on the burst buffer for how much space you need and it copies the data that you want from the file system into that burst buffer. So you have a copy of your data that's on this fast storage device. Then when your job starts running, when it actually hits the running state in the scheduler, that, that happens before your charge time, by the way. Uh, all, all that stuff gets set up. Then your application actually starts. You're using your compute hours on the system, and you access that data just like you would any other file or directory. It's just going to this faster scratch pad here on the burst buffer nodes. Um, so this, this stuff is set up for you, and then this is the point where it gets to your application. Your application is just accessing the data. Once it's done, uh, you've specified in your job script that you want some things to be copied back out. Uh, you're no longer being billed for hours, and the system comes behind you and copies this stuff out to the storage system. And it frees up the burst buffer nodes that someone else who comes and says, I'd like, you know, 500 terabytes will have 500 terabytes available to use. So it just lasts for the duration of your job, and the data lives for the long term on the same storage system that it always has. So the, the as you might imagine, there's this this is a complication, right? So there's a lot of ways to get to your data now. Um, the arrow at the top is the conventional way. Um, you just go to the storage system directly. You can still do that. You don't have to use the burst buffers at all um, if you don't want to. Uh, you can access data that's stored on the burst buffers. The burst buffers can talk to the file system. Um, and your compute node can talk to both. Your compute node can talk to the file system. Your compute node can talk to the burst buffers. This uh, leads to something that intuitively sounds like it would be a convenient thing to do in your script, but is actually a very bad thing, is you can submit a job script. And rather than using these directives, you can say, I, you know, these directives are kind of weird. I, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I can write a bash script that just copies the data to the burst buffer, operates on it, copies it back out. That will work, but it's, it's bad news because when you run a copy command from your job, let's say you want to copy from the file system to the burst buffer, what it's going to do is transfer all the data to the memory in your compute nodes, then copy it all back out to the burst buffer. So you're taking a very circuitous route to your, your uh, moving your data where you want to do, and not only that, you're using your core hours to do it. So that's easy, you can copy, but um, you're gonna use your hours and you're, it's gonna take a while because you're 
copying data where you don't need to. So if you use the job directives that say prepare this data for me, um, you don't get billed for it and it comes straight from the storage system to the burst buffer nodes without bothering your compute nodes. So that's, that's one takeaway from the system they have at NURSE now is uh, don't copy data manually, use the directives. And what does this look like uh, sort of in practice just to give you a feel for um, you know, what you see as a user on the system when you log in. Uh, I'll take a little little sidetrack for a minute. There's a time frame for delivering this software that's on the system. Um, so the hardware is there, uh, early users can access it. They have stages of what functionality is gonna be available. The stage that we're in right now is stage one, where you can set up a burst buffer storage area uh, data can be striped across it. It can pull data in and out of that storage system, what I just described. Stage two, uh, to start arriving later in the year um, and a little bit into next year, is transparent mode, where you don't do that. You instead access your data like you normally would, and through the magic of computer science, it gets on the burst buffer um, or pushes back out from the burst buffer. I'm not going to talk about that today because it's not there. We don't know what the best practices are going to be for using that, but I want to put it up there because that's, that's going to be an option at some point is to, instead of doing this uh, thing that I just described where you copy data in and out, there is going to be a way to do it transparently. We just don't exactly know what the characteristics of that are going to be. Um, the last stage, uh, sometime in the future, that's running off of our timeline here is not merely using these burst buffers for a place to put your data, but doing some processing on the data while it's there. Um, so that could be some in-transit analysis to try and speed up uh, things that you would normally do on the compute node. You could do it on the data as it's transferring through the system. Uh, there could be some compression there. There could be some filtering there to decide what data to keep and throw away. So those uh, burst buffer nodes, they have processors in them. So of course, uh, everybody in this room is going to try and use those processors to calculate something. So that's, that's what's going to be enabled eventually. So if you have access to the system at NERSC or you get access in the near future when they open up availability, um, you put some directives in your job script. You hopefully don't modify your application except to change the configuration file or the arguments to it to say, you know, access data in this path instead of the other path. And and that's kind of it. Um, now, what do those directives look like? Uh, this is this is to give you an idea of what you have control over, and maybe give you a clue as to why people think it'd be better just to copy data. Um, is this is a example of a job script from uh, the Slurm scheduler that they use at NERSC, and parts of this are normal. Um, this uh, this you know. You've got your, your normal batch parameters that you would put in there. Maybe there's different syntax you can use. You've got your job here at the last line. That's where you actually do your S run and launch your application. Um, on other systems, that might be an MPI run or AP run. But these special things are these lines that start with DW. DW stands for Data Warp, which is Cray's uh, vendor product for doing this stuff. And the, there's four parameters listed here. The first line, job data warp, it lets you set a few parameters. So the capacity is how much storage you actually want to use. So that's pretty straightforward. This, this job wants a terabyte of data to use. And this is integrated with a scheduler, so it won't start your job until there's a terabyte if for some reason it's oversubscribed. So this is another resource just like compute nodes. You can tell it what mode you want. Striped means that um, However many burst buffer nodes I get, spread the data across all of them so I can get as much bandwidth as possible. And then the type is uh, scratch, which means that I want some storage space that's just going to live while my job's running and then go away. Uh, there will eventually be some other modes. You can have, uh, maybe you can put some data in a burst buffer and have it stay there for a little while, start another job that will then access it. I'm not sure that's totally worked out yet. Scratch is kind of the, the way to go for the moment. And then these stage in and stage out commands are the ones that describe, um, you know, I have some data that's on, on the Lustre file system, and I want it to end up over here in this other directory in my scratch buffer so that I can operate on it using the burst buffer while my job's running. And then similarly, there's an output directive that says, once I'm done, anything that I've left in this subdirectory, copy it back out to the storage system for me. So these, these things, the uh, stage in and stage out, 
tells the job scheduler what needs to be pulled in before your application runs and what needs to be put out once your application is done. And so that sounds a little complicated, but you know your your application hasn't changed and your other parameters to your JavaScript have not changed. You know, if if you just keep an eye on what's on the systems. If you go to the NERSC web page and look for burst buffers, you can get their timeline. But you can uh, keep tabs on it and see what they're doing. Uh, Cori itself will be going down to uh, rewire some things and come back up with more capacity. Um, the ALCF is also working on their system that I would expect uh, within, within this calendar year as well. If anyone has uh, any you know, questions about what's coming or how you might use this, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, so the question is, does the model assume that uh, that uh, enough storage is there, or will it help you if you know if, this, if your data won't fit in the storage capacity? The uh, the harsh reality right now is that there's there's no help. If you tell it I need a megabyte, and then you try to put a gigabyte in there, it's it's not going to work. Um, so your your job will fail or produce some errors about you know setting up the data. Uh, now, what will happen in the longer run when the systems come online that can do transparent caching is that they will, in theory, be able to handle this. So your transparent cache, you may say, I, I believe that I'll need a terabyte. If it runs beyond that, it's just going to start going to the regular storage system. So it won't break. It'll get slower. Um, but the reality right now on Cori is if you don't specify the right size, it's just going to break. There's no more there. Um, is there a, uh, a way of, of flushing the burst buffer uh, during the run instead of I mean, at the end of the run? Yep, so the question is, is there a way to flush the burst buffer during your run instead of waiting all the way to the end? And indeed there is. So there are uh, the data warp software that, uh, that NERSC is using has uh, some extra controls that I didn't show here. Uh, the two things that are most notable is there are command line commands that you can put in your scripts. So Suppose you had a um, MPI run application, MPI run application, like maybe you ran a sequence in there. You could put commands in between them that force data out to the storage system along the way. Uh, they also have a library API, so you can link in, I'm not sure what it's called, maybe lib.warp or something, but it has some calls that you can put into your code actually while you're running your code, say, you know, start flushing this out, and I'm going to keep computing while you do that. It's asynchronous. So you can start a transfer and then later on, wait for the transfer to complete. Um, the only caveat, uh, particularly with the, the library approach, is that that's not portable, right? So that will only work with Cray's products. So, you know, maybe as time evolves, we'll have some standardized APIs, but there is not right now. <laughs>